Hello, everyone, and welcome to On Community Care, documenting APA Voices during COVID-19, an APA Voices public memory project event. Thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Chen Schultz, and I am the Deputy Director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. The slideshow that played while you were waiting for the program to begin features items donated to the APA Voices COVID-19 Public Memory Project and ended with Alexander Cathedral's Back to Work, one of the 15 micro documentaries and three personal essays donated by the Asian American Documentary Network. Thanks to all of our artifact donors, as well as to the many interviewers and narrators who contributed and continue to contribute to this ongoing APA Voices Public Memory Project. You will hear from many of them today. Before we begin, I want to share that during this webinar, all audio will be live captioned. To enable captions, please click the CC button on your Zoom screen. You can also opt to view captions in a separate dialog box. A link to the dialog box and instructions on how to access closed captions and adjust your settings will be shared in the chat. I would like to, us to take a moment to acknowledge that even though we are gathered virtually today from many places, APA Institute at NYU is located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would also like to recognize that New York City is currently home to approximately 100,000 people who identify as indigenous, including many peoples from the Pacific. If you are unsure about whose land you are on, we encourage you to find out. We're placing a link that might help you to begin that process in the chat. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And today we are offering a few ways to support indigenous communities in New York and across the country. If you are able to consider contributing to COVID-19 mutual aid and relief funds organized by indigenous peoples who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. A few links are being shared in the chat. You also might learn about ways to support the Warriors of the Sunrise, who have organized a campaign to protect Shinnecock land on Long Island. A link is being shared in the chat as well. Here at APA Institute, our programming theme this year is Our Politics Ourselves, in which we examine our turbulent and swiftly changing political landscape, the role Asian Pacific Americans play in these changes, and their impact on our communities. To stay updated on these and other APA Institute activities, Follow us on social media at APA Institute on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and consider signing up to receive our newsletter. In addition to the many project volunteers, narrators, artifact contributors, and core committee members who contributed to today's event, we would like to thank Patricia Kim, NYU Tenement Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives, New York Center for Global Asia, NYU Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and Monument Lab for their generous planning and co-sponsorship support. And thank you to our APA Institute student staff who helped make everything happen. Rosario Joaquin, Peyton Emery, and Anna Park. We hope today's program gives you a glimpse into the project into the many voices, organizations, and communities that have contributed to APA Voices thus far. Our program begins with framing remarks followed by reflections from project contributors a panel on community care and ends with a screening of the mini doc 100 miles apart by Garvo Sibaboro and a poetry reading by Tayo Na. Questions will be taken via the Q&A function, so please feel free to submit your questions there throughout the event. The APA staff will use chat to share out resources. This event is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube and at apa.nyu.edu in the coming weeks. I'm very happy to now introduce three individuals who have been instrumental in helping to shape APA Voices, a COVID-19 public memory project. Lena Z is a cultural organizer and writer from New York City and is a member of the APA Voices core committee. Shannon O'Neill is curator of the NYU Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives and a consultant for APA Voices. And Crystal Peck is associate professor at University of California, Riverside and an APA Voices volunteer. Thank you again for joining us and please welcome Lena Z. Thank you for that land acknowledgement and that introduction, Laura. Thank you to APA, Laura and Amita for hosting us in big and small ways. 
Thank you to the volunteer interviewers, donor, donors, narrators, we've assembled for this effort in this very strange year. And thanks especially to my co-conspirators in Vivian, Diane, and to Mia. I've been tasked with briefly offering some overarching remarks pointing to the origins of this project. So let me quickly lay out one or two foundational through lines or tracks that others will pick up on and take further and develop more beautifully tonight. Early this year, um, if you'll recall, uh, in New York City during the spring, during those very hard days, confronted with reductive, rather reductive representations of certain communities lauded as particularly, particularly exemplary or especially vulnerable and representations of Asians as victims of violence or as perpetrators of the violence of the virus, we drawing on our collective knowledge and in conversation with each other developed a framework for this public memory project in which stories and artifacts would reveal APA experiences about this moment in time. And that is actually how the collaboration began out of great disruption and loss. But as many of you know, memory work is no perfect thing. It does not resolve trauma. It doesn't correct history. It is incomplete, ongoing, unfolding, imperfect in every way. Very quickly though, we articulated a set of guiding principles that you can find on our website, some of whose keywords I would like to just name. Solidarity, difference, care, community. There are a variety of ways we have yet to go in our focus and the knowledge we bring to bear. Our project in this year, it turns out, uh, at all, are not exceptional at all, but rather emerge out of existing systems and epistemes that enable the violence done to APA individuals and communities in this year and uphold white supremacy, anti-Black racism and ableism always. Uh, we strive to work against these, unjust, these impulses, these practices, and these systems. So centering care in our documentation practice has made us rethink our work. The differences among us, among those of us who are labeled APA in a flattening way, or who gets acknowledged at all as the quote unquote norm subject, um, has had the continual effect of decentering or complicating who or what gets to be included as part of the historical record. We try in this project not to document for documentation's sake. We do not imagine the consumer of this archive as some future historian who makes meaning at that future point over there, but rather to illuminate or collaborate or co-produce with people meaning right here, right now. For this project to have uses and implications for, to, for people from whom we're drawing stories and artifacts, communities of workers and artists and organizers. When we started this project, we could only begin to intuit the devastating economic fallout, and we couldn't anticipate the racial reckoning and uprisings of this year, but our key words resonate still. Solidarity, difference, care, community. We hope you'll ask questions and stay engaged. Thank you for taking part in this event. I will turn now to Shannon O'Neill of Tama Mint Library, whose thoughtfulness and own ethics of care has made her such a trusted partner to our work. Thank you so much, Lena, for that beautiful framing. Um, so the Tama Mint Wagner collections, which are an archives within NYU Special Collections, document political and social movements. And working in partnership with the Asian Pacific American Institute, the Tama Mint is committed to being a permanent home for APA materials in the New York metro region and more widely the East Coast. Um, I'm really quite humbled to join you all tonight. I began working at NYU a little over a year ago, and one of the most fulfilling, joyful, and exciting parts of my job has been the Tama Mint's collaborations with the APA Institute. And so I really want to um, begin first by giving my gratitude to APA for allowing me to learn and grow with you. Um, it's also just been such a privilege to witness the unfolding um, of the APA Voices Public Memory Project. So 
Thank you to um, Tomia Arai, Lena Z, Vivian Trung, and um, Diane Wong for inviting my participation. And thank you to all of the interviewers, narrators, artifact donors, and more broadly, this community for entrusting the Tammanmit Wagner collections as a home for your histories. Um, so lately, I've been thinking a lot about care work, in particular, as it relates to archival labor and community partnerships. Care work has historically been an invisibilized form of labor, often disparaged and demoted as being background work, and yet our world does not function without it. Care work is nurturing, healing, noticing, attending to, feeding, and holding. It takes seriously our mutual vulnerability and precarity, and it finds space for building collective power. It acknowledges our interdependent sociality, and it's about practicing radical kinship. While the APA Voices Public Memory Project documents community care work in response to the movement for Black Lives and the ongoing crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, the creation of this collection, your intimate witnessing, sharing, authoring, making, and listening is also care work. It bears repeating that real harm and violence are enacted in the ways in which archives inscribe and reinscribe racism, ableism, and heteropatriarchy but as writer and scholar Sadia Hartman has said, care is the antidote to violence. The APA Voices Public Memory Project is both an antidote and an intervention. This project rejects the cold distance and alienation that institutions so often thrive upon. Instead, the APA Voices Project is an invitation into the intimacy of entanglement. And it's in these spaces of deep mutual care where we can seek and find our allies. Um, this project is really a model for the Tamament for how to uphold and amplify memory work that centers relationality, interdependence, and empathy. And I'm so honored to have the responsibility of thinking together with you all about how these materials will be preserved and made accessible. And I'm just really grateful to have this opportunity to join you all in this care work. So thank you very much. And now um, Crystal Pick will share more about the project's approach and processes. Great, thank you so much, Shannon. And um, thank you, Lena, also for such insightful comments. Um, I want to thank the APA Institute for organizing this memory project and this amazing event. And of course, just all of the wonderful contributors who provided um, time and energy um, into this work. So before we delve into the program, um, I want to just provide brief framing remarks that really build on um, Lena's and Shannon's comments. Um, so maybe more specifically, I want to sort of think about this question together with all of you. Um, you know, for those of us immersed in this project as planners, as coordinators, as archivists, as interviewers, um, you know, what does it mean uh, and feel like to center critical care in documentation work during a time of prolonged violence as well as acute trauma? So as Lena noted, this time that we're in, um, pandemic time, is extraordinary in so many ways. Um, but it's also made hyper visible and really amplified an already existing um, and fragile ecology of fracture points of violence and harm. So for instance, alongside um, heightened forms of violence enacted against Asian Americans, this time has also overlapped with ongoing acts of police brutality against black communities and the accelerated detention and deportation of immigrants and refugees. So I think in this way, um, you know, it's impossible to separate the effects of COVID-19 from white supremacy, transphobia, detention, deportation, and carceral violence. Um, so understanding that COVID-19 is really entangled, right, and, um, and heightened also by other forms of violence, Project members during our first few meetings um, when we were discussing the project, you know, we really addressed the necessity of documenting pandemic experiences that work against extraction and exploitation. So I think sometimes when we're documenting experiences of violence, trauma, and pain in live or real time, there can be such little time to actually reflect on the process and unintentionally, um, we can also be driven by a desire, as Lena noted, to document for the sake of creating records. Um, 
And while historical documentation, of course, is important, it's necessary to always situate this work in tandem with care and relationship building. So that is creating and caring for records should be inseparable from creating relations of care with each other. Um, and all of us involved with this project in different capacities, you know, as volunteer, um, volunteer organizers, interviewers, archivists are also experiencing the pandemic and are enmeshed in the systems and structures that take center stage and the narratives that are shared. So reflective of the memory archive that's being collectively generated, our own experiences reflect different locations, positions, and varying degrees of access to security, safety, and resources. We wear multiple hats and are educators, scholars, cultural workers, caregivers, mutual aid workers, and members of different families, both given and chosen, and communities with different gifts and abilities. Thus, as the project unfolded, I really began to understand this work as an emergent practice of care, where support and reflection are actually integrated into the process. Um, so for instance, check-in circles were created where groups of interviewers could actually share their concerns or questions and experiences with each other. Um, and I think the temporality of this project feels really differently um, than other documentation projects that I've been a part of. Um, I think in part, we realize that we can only do this kind of care work when we deprioritize absolute deadlines or goals or accumulated progress because um, precarity and uncertainty are a part of rather than challenges to this collective labor. So second, um, since all of us are actually living through and experiencing the pandemic at this moment, the memory community that we've created is really a work in progress where we continue to learn from each other, be open to feedback and shift or revise as necessary. And I think this in and of itself can be really difficult work. So it necessitates a deep commitment to accountability care and listening. Um, so for instance, something that emerged early in our discussions um, was the relevance of reciprocity. So, um, you know, put differently, it's really making sure that we're sharing and or returning these narratives back to participants in ways that resonate for them. And we know that reciprocity looks differently and means different things to different people. So for some, reciprocity emerges through the interview itself um, because we're co-creating a held time and space together where participants share and process difficult experiences. Um, for others, reciprocity in return compels us as organizers and co-coordinators to intentionally share this project with others, especially beyond um, academia. So, you know, what will it look like to share this work through a public syllabus and related pedagogical resources? Um, you know, what does it look like to collaborate with and support mutual aid networks and community spaces? So that this project is really a starting rather than an endpoint to sustaining meaningful relationships. And even as we discuss the necessity of public access how might we actually condition this call so we're honoring the varying abilities, priorities, and safety of participants in ways that might even challenge how we might normally understand what public access is in the first place. So finally, I want to acknowledge the significance of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander experiences in this care work. So for the AP Institute, I think um, you know, it's really important to center the experiences of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities because the Institute has a commitment to uh, really honoring and prioritizing Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander scholarship, activism, and cultural labor in its programming. Um, and as you know, it's been shared by Laura, um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities and really more broadly indigenous communities have been disproportionately impacted um, by COVID-19. Um, so with this in mind, this project also acknowledges the ways in which Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander experiences are all, all too often collapsed um, in problematic ways with Asian American experiences. So for all of us, I know it's essential to really continue this project in ways that explicitly hold and reckon with this structural concern. And I know that APA Institute will be foregrounding COVID-19 experiences within um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities through our free programming. So I just want to briefly flag this as we transition into the program. So with that said, I'll give it to Diane Wong. 
Thank you so much, Crystal, for those thoughtful and timely remarks. Um, it's just been such a lovely journey learning from you and building in community with you in the last few months. So I am going to be moderating this segment of the event, which includes short reflections from critical voices from our public memory project. Um, this first question goes to Lubna Kutami, who is a project narrator and an assistant professor in the Department of Asian American Studies at UCLA. Her research broadly examines transnational Palestinian youth movements. Over the last several months, you've carried out a number of virtual interviews with community members, activists, and organizers. What has the experience of conducting Zoom interviews been like for you? So Lubna is teaching and can't be with us today, but left us a short recorded video. I believe that this is the only type of knowledge production um, that is relevant in today's world, uh, a world that is sorely needing an alternative to the various forms of crisis and catastrophe that exist within and all around us. Uh, the team working on the project have been such uh, incredible um, leaders uh, showing how um, we may not as researchers be able to capture the depths of this particular moment, but that we can try to really practice intentional listening to hear what the community is saying, how they have endured this pandemic, how they have fared through it, and what it sheds light on um, regarding the world that existed prior to the pandemic and the world that we can collectively build um, instead of what we have in place today. This has been the most rewarding uh, part of my, my participation in the project was getting to hear from organizers from Palestine and Lebanon and Egypt, getting to hear about how street vendors have mobilized themselves against egregious policies that have suppressed their rights, um, their rights in New York City, getting to hear about how students in Chicago have um, not only survived, but thrived through the pandemic, how they've been able to establish new mechanisms and establish major breakthroughs with their community on certain social and political issues that they had long been um, trying to, to fight for, how communities who have experienced so much ideological and geographic forms of fragmentation actually were given the space to reconnect with one another through the pandemic, um, through a lot of the different virtual um, activities that have taken place that have you know, allowed people to overcome hardened divisions uh, by, by, place, by place and geography and so forth. So as much as this pandemic has caused catastrophes and crises across the world, and as much as people are hurting and suffering from it, I, I believe that one of the beauty, beautiful things about the COVID-19 Public Memory Project is that it also allowed us to understand how people are thriving and how they're surviving and how they are steadfast and how they are demonstrating um, beautiful examples of what, you know, what community could really mean and uh, beautiful examples of what could happen if we are forced to imagine another world. This next question goes to Mike Keo, who is an artifact donor and founder of the I'm Not a Virus campaign, an artist-led initiative that does impactful work on activating communities through storytelling, education, and mental wellness around issues of anti-racism. The I'm Not a Virus campaign has been so vital in addressing anti-Asian xenophobia and violence in the wake of the pandemic. Can you tell us about how the campaign began and what the impact has been through your visual storytelling? Hi, so the campaign began in early March, late February, um, when we're hearing this rhetoric of the Chinese virus, the Wuhan flu. And, um, you know, it was reminiscent of to save a deer, kill a mong, and a lot of the rhetoric against Asian Americans throughout the years. And so I, I was looking for an outlet to kind of deal with my frustration and my, what I was going through seeing this. So I began taking portraits of friends and family. The picture here is my sister. And it was to activate Asian Americans into their own storytelling to reclaim what we celebrate about ourselves and who we are 
And to create a narrative that attacking as an Asian American was an attack against your neighbor, you know, and I really wanted to center the photos around joy and celebration as opposed to, um, you know, hurt and um, scared because I wanted to give us an outlet to say who we were. Um, the photos went online in about mid-March. And during that time, my sister-in-law, who is Hmong American, was attacked, was verbally attacked inside a grocery store in, um, in Rhode Island. One of um, the first people I took a portrait of, my neighbor Julius, who is Filipino American from Connecticut, his sister was attacked at her house while walking, um, or on her street while walking with her mother. You know, so it, uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to highlight all these stories and um, put faces to, you know, who we are, because oftentimes when you hear about hate crimes, you don't really get a visual of who it affects. Um, Admirasia, um, what's called Ogilvy Health, and a few other ad agencies saw what the work we were doing, so they contacted us. And we've been able to create um, bodies of work to address racism against Asian American. We've, uh, most of the stuff that we're trying to do right now is, um, you know, after COVID is over, racism will still exist. So how do we combat these stereotypes? Um, we created a coloring book with Admiration here that includes Asian American pioneers. Um, Kelly Ha, our campaign manager with um, UConn Asian American Studies Institute has created a mental workbook for, a mental health workbook for Asian Americans. And these are like, you know, our, our work, the visuals allowed us to create these larger networks than ourselves to create new materials to dream of a better, you know, a better space where it is more inclusive to be Asian American. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. The uh, book will be linked in our resources at the end of the conversation. So this final question goes to Lisa Fu, who is a project narrator and has been with the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative for 12 years, working at the intersections of environmental justice, reproductive justice, immigrant rights, and racial justice. The pandemic has so deeply impacted the nail and beauty industry. Can you talk about how the collaborative has responded and advocated for nail salon workers and their families and small immigrant and refugee owned businesses since the shutdown and in these last several months? So for us in the Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, you know, we're a California based organization and there are over 400,000 licensed manicurists and cosmetologists in the state that, that can do nails. And essentially the, um, in March, all nail salons were shut down. And um, we as an organization have never really done a lot of direct service and we completely shifted to providing direct service. So we created um, an emergency community care fund. We raised over, we have raised so far over $150,000 to provide emergency aid to our community members. Um, we supported hundreds of people to apply for um, unemployment insurance online. And these are folks who have, may not even have an email address, let alone can apply and have the tech savvy to um, apply for unemployment insurance on a government database in English. And so, um, you know, the, the, the database was crashing so much when it was first, during the first few weeks of the pandemic. So we actually, our staff were, were staying up um, and setting appointments with members at like three in the morning to help them apply online when those were like the less trafficked times, less trafficked hours of the uh, state databases um, and really helping them set up an email account, um, figure out how to apply and really navigate the unemployment insurance and EDD system in California, which, was, which, was, which has been struggling a lot. Um, one of the other things that we did was help to create reopening guidelines. So in preparation for nail salons for when they would eventually reopen, we nail salon owners and workers wanted to know what should they be doing. And so we actually have a scientific advisory committee and created with them and created with some of our member leaders guidelines on what nail salons specifically should be doing. We actually translated it. 
And um, it was actually more comprehensive than what the state and what the counties put out. So it was all inclusive um, specifically for the community and it was translated and what, and what the government was putting out was not translated at first. And so um, we were providing a lot of trainings to, to folks. We created a set of six work uh, fact sheets in language and um, provided a lot of information over Facebook Live, over um, FaceTime uh, and through social media and different avenues. Um, we also, you know, the governor in May, you know, there were ebbs and flows of kind of crises that we were going through as an industry and as an organization. And one of the crises we addressed in addition to just COVID um, was that in May, the governor actually said that the first case of community spread of COVID happened in a nail salon. He said this during one of his press conferences. That night, one of our staff got 100 missed calls from our members, from community members saying, what is he talking about? Why is he, why is he singling us out? We were already struggling. We we're already on the ground. Um, there was already anti-Asian violence happening. And, um, you know, through that, we actually were advocating and met with the governor's administration to talk about that and to talk about safe reopening. And during one of the meetings, he actually they actually admitted that what the governor said was incorrect, but it was too late. It was too little, too late. And um, you know, it was just another blow to the industry. Um, we continued to support folks as the movement for Black Lives and. Um, protests against George Floyd's killings came up um, in throughout the country. We had multiple conversations about the importance of racial justice, solidarity, and understanding anti-Black racism. Um, and our organization really became like a fallback and a, and a friend to many community members. Um, some of our programming included um, doing uh, uh, phone banking. So, you know, calling folks, calling members, uh, Vietnamese manicurists to um, fill out the census, to register to vote. And these calls, which are usually five to 10 minutes long, ended up being half hour wellness checks with strangers who usually, you know, Asian, in Asian communities, there's not a lot of like, you don't end up talking spilling your guts out to somebody that you don't know that this is what was happening. This is what the community needed. And so we, we, we ended up providing a safe space and a channel for community to come to, to talk about concerns. Um, and we're, we have been seeing a lot of increases of uh, mental health distress, um, trauma, um, and re -trauma, being re-traumatized already as refugees. And then again, by what's happening, um, not having enough support, not having a bailout for small businesses. And so, um, you know, for us really, it's not over. Um, COVID is still happening. Nail salons are still struggling. And so um, we are really trying to channel their energy communities um, experiences to really build power and continue to grow and um, build opportunities and create more of a sense of community here in California. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this critical work. And for folks who wanna learn more or to support um, the California Healthy Nail, Sal Nail Salon Collaborative, please check the link that Laura dropped in the chat. And so now I'm going to turn things over to Vivian Trung, who's a dear friend, a professor, and a core committee member um, of this project who will be moderating our panel on community care. Great, thank you so much, Diane. And it's also really amazing just to see uh, this culmination after several months of uh, working on this project of um, how many people have you know, contributed to building this. Uh, so I'm honored to be able to moderate this panel on community care with uh, three of the narrators who have been interviewed through uh, the APA Voices Project. So our panel today is going to focus on 
the theme of community care. And it's been clear through um, the past several months of the pandemic, uh, the negligent response of the state from uh, the local to the federal level that um, communities of color and immigrant communities have had to rely on and, and turn to each other for support. Um, and we're excited to welcome three narrators who represent different approaches to community care, including art, mutual aid, and community organizing. So our panelists for today are Mumita Ahmed, who is a political organizer and community activist who spent mo most of her life in Queens after immigrating from Bangladesh at eight years old. She is a founder of Millennials for Bernie Sanders, Bangladeshi Americans for Political Progress, and Queens Mutual Aid Network, which we'll be talking about more today. Um, our next panelist is Kajua Va, who is the founder and co-executive director of Freedom Inc. in Madison, Wisconsin. She came to this country as a refugee from Laos and spent the past 20 years of her life working to build collective power and social change within Southeast Asian and Black communities. And our final panelist for today is Man Yi Chao, who is a queer Taiwanese Chinese American artist from Seattle. And they explore healing through colon decolonization, community, and reconnecting with their ancestral lineage through a variety of mediums focusing on themes of labor. Um, so Kajua, Mani, and Mumita, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I wanted to start off with a first set of questions um, focusing on the impact of the pandemic on the communities that you live in and work with. Uh, so Lumita, perhaps if we could start with you. Um, so especially in March and April, uh, Queens and New York City was the global epicenter of the pandemic. And I was wondering if you could give us a sense of how COVID-19 has um, impacted the Bangladeshi and immigrant communities in Queens. Thank you so much for that question. And thank you for having me. Thank you to the panelists. Um, yes, the Bangladeshi community knew so many people who have died during COVID-19, especially um, we've, we've watched our neighbors carried out in stretchers right across the street for me. There were people, there were five ambulances that showed up within a 24 hour period. Um, many of us didn't have access to language. And so the news of COVID and quarantining didn't receive, um, didn't, uh, didn't get here to our communities on time. So many people um, from our communities are also essential workers with um, informal jobs and um, high rates of diabetes. And um, many of us live in very close living quarters because we're so working class and struggling with housing that um, COVID really impacted us. We had families who were subletting living rooms with another family so that they could afford rent. And those families were then thrown out and forced to live in shelters. My work with uh, mutual aid, I learned about, we have a rate of domestic violence in our community. So we, we saw a rise in women from the Bangladeshi community living in the homeless shelters. Um, and uh, many, of our worker, many of our community members are also undocumented. So um, majority of them didn't receive pandemic relief and be able to pay rent. Um, and that was sort of the reality because of the district that I'm in, it, it's very working class. And the area that I'm in is Jamaica, which was one of the epicenters of um, the virus. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that, Mumita. And I, th I think it's a you know really sobering portrait of what was happening um, in the pandemic, especially at the height of um, the the coronavirus in um, in New York City. Um, so I, next, I'd like to ask um, Kajua about um, the what you've seen in Madison, Wisconsin, especially working with um, two communities that have been going through. A crisis, you know, long before the pandemic even happened, with um, Southeast Asian communities that are still feeling the effects and legacies of the war, and of course with Black communities that have experienced hundreds of years of oppression in the United States. Um, so, Kajua, if you could talk about um, the impact of the pandemic on these communities that you work with in Madison, Wisconsin. Good evening. Um, 
Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I know that uh, we had this conversation, uh, this interview quite a while back. And so uh, several things have changed, but many things have not. Um, I think that for, to give you a little context about the Midwest, as particularly Wisconsin, um, in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, black folks make up about 7% of the population and over 60% um, of those um, currently in our um, uh, Dane County Jail. And so if you can uh, understand um, that kind of dynamic, and then on top of that, 7% uh, population of, of black people, but overwhelmingly um, all the young people who come into contact with policing in schools are about 80% of them are black. And so um, we live in a city that's pretty pro progressive to people throughout uh, the US. Um, they know Madison to be a progressive city, but those of us who are poor, who are Southeast Asian, black living in Madison, we know that there are two cities one for us and one for uh, white folks. And so that's very similar to many uh, poor uh, uh, Southeast Asian or poor uh, people of color, black folks, um, cities throughout the US. And so we're no different from that. Uh, and so if you can understand that uh, dynamic and those data, then you know what we've um, been struggling with prior to COVID. And so prior to, uh, 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 prior to COVID, we had been working on a four-year campaign to get cops out of schools uh, to, because we knew that it disproportionately was impacting our communities, particularly Black communities. For those of you who don't know Freedom Inc., uh, we are Black, uh, Southeast Asian, feminist, uh, queer, uh, femme organization, and we are an abolitionist organization. Um, and so to be that and then to be um, in Wisconsin and to be in Madison um, is quite unique. And so prior to the pandemic, we had already been struggling with um, in one year, uh, in two years, we've lost about seven to eight Khmer elders, Cambodian elders due to cancer. And it was, these were not people who were diagnosed a long time and had been fighting a long time. These are women within two months of being diagnosed had died. And so what that said to us was they did not have adequate access to, to healthcare. Um, and on, on top of that, the disproportionate confinement of black people in the state of Wisconsin, uh, we were dealing with that. For Hmong folks here, prior to uh, the pandemic or the virus being called the Chinese virus, we were already dealing with uh, the racism uh, in Northern Wisconsin that you all have uh, read about where uh, we've had signs that to save a hunter, kill a Hmong person. And so we have interactions of Hmong people um, and white people in Northern Wisconsin and the racism that we endure in this in the state. And with Hmong people being the largest population of Asian Americans in the state of Wisconsin, we consistently uh, have lived through um, uh, lo a lot of racism in this, uh, in this state. In addition to that, because we're Southeast Asian or Southeast Asian organization, we had, and black organization, we had already seen um, what the education system and how it disproportionately leaves our children behind and how they disproportionately label our children um, with uh, learning disab uh, disability and tracking them in that route. Um, and so when the pandemic hit, all of these things were highlighted. And what was highlighted was, and in addition to that, we're a domestic violence sexual assault organization. So we're anti-Asian, anti-violence organization. We fight all forms of patriarchal violence and police is one of that. Police violence is one of those violence that we fight. And so in addition to that, when the pandemic started and people were being sheltered um, in place, uh, it was not an option for the uh, hundreds of families that we were working with. And so we were quickly uh, uh, forced into organizing. And we literally went into like 300 homes and set up Zoom for each of the people that we had been working with. And so every uh, person, every staff member had to reach out to a member. So we never sheltered in place. Um, as an organization from day one, we have been essential workers from day one. Um, we have been providing services for our people from day one. 
And so I think that it's the pandemic has been devastating. Um, and I'm just gonna, I know that I have a time limit too, so let me know. But the uh, pandemic has been devastating for our communities. In two, uh, I'm just gonna say two, two quick reasons why I think. One, the killing of George Floyd. Uh, we did not have an opportunity to stay uh, sheltered in place because we had to fight. We had to fight for what was right. And so if uh, the pandemic is, we had to make a decision. The pandemic would kill you if we hit the streets, but if we don't hit the streets, the police are killing black people. And so that was not an option for us, even as Southeast Asians to stay quiet and to stay sheltered in place. The other piece is, do you stay shelter in place? Do you not come to work? And then the rest of your, your community will not have their essential needs met. And when I say essential needs, I am talking about will not have rice, will not have vegetables. These are elders who do not have transportation in the first place. So trying to figure that piece out. What about the kids who are living in homes where there's domestic violence and sexual assault? If we don't stay open, who then can they go to for help? And then on top of that, just because there's a pandemic that's killing hundreds of thousands of people does not mean domestic violence is not happening. And so as an organization, we had, these were the hard decisions that we had to make. Um, I can say that several um, of our young people who work for Freedom Inc. are COVID positive. Many of our families, Southeast Asian families were COVID positive and never told their employers because they could not afford not to go to work. And so it's deeply impacted us. And then the last thing I wanted to say is, as far as the education system, we already knew it was, a fail, it was failing our kids, both Southeast Asian and black kids. But what the pandemic did was, it just showed you how far behind we were. And it showed you how little resource we, we had. Many people didn't even have computers at home. The majority did not have access to uh, high-speed internet. Kids were doing homework from a cell phone. One kid didn't even know they had 28 projects that was due. So I'm just saying that it, it has deeply impacted us. And when, when 45 mentioned and said that the, uh, this was a Chinese virus, I want everybody to know, people don't know the difference between Hmong and Chinese. They think you're all Chinese. And so we also had to fight that fight. Right, thank you so much, Kajua. And I think it really um, highlights, you know, who is able to, you know, shelter at home and redefines the idea of who is essential worker is beyond like healthcare workers and, uh, you know, grocery store workers to, you know, thinking about like organizers as essential workers, right? Um, so thank you so much. And um, I'd like to also pose a question to Manyi, um, who is based in, Seattle's Chinatown about the effects that you've seen in that neighborhood. Um, so we all know that, um, you know, in the weeks and months leading up to the actual spread of the virus in the US that Chinatowns were seeing the effects um, long before that, right? And um, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, as someone who's also grown up in your own family's restaurant, the impact on uh, small businesses and in the neighborhood. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be a part of this conversation. Um, as a resident here in Seattle's Chinatown International District, um, it was really clear before the virus had reached the states, um, the effect on Chinatowns. Um, I think the businesses here in our international district had uh, a 70, a reported 70% drop in business um, and it was really clear on the streets that no one was coming um, to visit our neighborhood no one was spending money and supporting the small businesses here um, I'm I think it was really clear that elders were told to stay inside and stay safe due to all of the um, extra heightened violence of like anti-Asian racism um, it's been really interesting and eerily like quiet um, and obviously that has gone through different transitions as you know eight months have passed um, and you know as there's a lot of violence that's also happening outside of that where you know I can think of a business that was robbed three times um, in the entire process of having COVID 
in our neighborhood and like in the city. And it was a really interesting dynamic, especially as like we are a neighboring city to the city that had um, the first reported case of COVID in the States. Um, I think that it's been really difficult to navigate also with um, disaster gentrification as well with private developers really taking advantage of an already vulnerable time um, and moving a lot of, you know, um, conversations into a virtual spaces that our residents and elders don't necessarily have access to. Um, and there was a story earlier in this year where we had a, a group of white supremacists who were posting all of these really racist stickers in our neighborhood, um, even being in the neighborhood, intimidating our residents and business owners. Um, I thank you for putting this up also. This is a poster that I made in response to that work. And um, I think that the neighborhood has been going through a lot of shifts and transitions throughout COVID with it really struggling in terms of business. We've been having a lot of um, arson happen in our neighborhood as well. It's been really clear all of the xenophobic um, effects on not only our Chinatown, but Chinatowns all over. Um, and yeah. And Mani, I was wondering since your, um, since your artwork is already up, if you could talk about um, the next set of questions, which is about um, your um, response to the pandemic in terms of your artistic practice. And um, in your interview, you talked about how um, art is a, you know, a way to address the despair that a lot of people are experiencing uh, right now and in the past several months. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about um, art as, as a form of community care. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. So I have a lot of really emotional responses as I'm really emotionally tied to Chinatown and everything that it has provided for both me and my family, especially as immigrants and um, housing us and keeping our people safe. Um, and so a lot of my work is deeply rooted in honoring that and honoring the neighborhood. And so when, especially when there are groups of people who want to intentionally come and intimidate our neighborhood and our people, um, I, I had a really hard time processing it. I had a really hard time coming into work um, as someone who walks to commute um, and seeing other people who are in fear of being in our space. And um, so this was um, a piece that I wanted to create in the form of like a talisman to offer protection and empowerment, um, acknowledging our histories as Chinatowns being built because of racism as a place of um, a safe place for for a lot of folks who were excluded. And so um, this poster ended up being a community-wide project. Um, and I'm so grateful for all of the support that it's gotten. It has, um, I think we had about 700 posters donated to us um, through a local printing company. I had a bunch of friends and community members organize these days where we would go and wheat paste and post and share these posters with uh, neighborhood, like small businesses. Um, I decided to make this also available onto my website for free so that folks who are everywhere can like download them. And um, these posters have found their way to like New York and Toronto. And it's been a really great way to sort of um, acknowledge the same like empowerment and protection that I felt like I've always received from not even just Chinatowns, but the community town or the communities that Chinatowns have offered me. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks so much for sharing your artwork. Um, my next question um, is um, for Kajua. So you talked a little bit already about um, the response that Freedom Inc. had to um, the effects of the pandemic. And I was wondering if it, you could um, share a little bit more about uh, what you see as the relationship. So I think Lisa mentioned this earlier about like this immediate shift to doing direct service work in the midst of a crisis and how you see that relationship between doing direct service and uh, the community organizing that you have been doing for years around uh, policing and medicine. 
I mean, in terms of uh, during the time of the pandemic and the George Floyd uh, uprising, yeah. I think that the the beauty of what we were able to do was that we had already been doing that kind of work. And so the per, uh, providing for our community uh, was something that we already had been doing because uh, the premise of what we believe and at the core of what we believe um, community organizing is based on is that you also have to meet the basic needs of your people before you can ask them to, to build uh, power. Um, and if people don't have enough to eat, how then can I ask them to come to a police um, out of school rally? Um, and so like really looking at how, how do you keep your community sustained? And so we had been running uh, community garden campaigns, uh, you know, fighting for spaces and land around the city that our people can grow their own food. And so we do community organizing and community services, uh, direct services hand in hand. How do you build, um, how do you, so one of our models is, uh, how do you uh, provide direct services to a victim of domestic violence, but at the same time when they become survivors, what does that look like? How do you move uh, someone who comes in for victimization services to survivorship to actually an organizer and being a leader in the community? And so that is our pathway um, in how we've done our work. And so when the pandemic and the um, and George Floyd uprising happened, we just went into to gear and we continue to do all the things that we, we normally do, which is one, we continue to build power with our people. And what does that mean? That meant that we had to build our base. And in fact, we built uh, and invited new base members because we knew that there was a group of people who had never known about us who actually really need us at this time. Uh, the number three, we wanted to defend each other, not only from COVID, but from police violence um, and from um, uh, systematic violence. Um, the other piece about protecting ourselves, I'll give you an example. When we were unsure if 45 was gonna leave office, and we live in a city where you all have known in Kenosha, where the white supremacists came out and killed two people uh, during the peaceful uprising um, in Kenosha. And so we had to go into to protective mode. How were we going to protect ourselves if, in fact, 45 does uh, uh, incite violence and uh, refuses to concede, which he has? And so we were able to tell people if there's problems and you need a place to go, this is the place to come to. Like we will protect each other. Um, and then also during the pandemic, we fought back and we fought back and we've pushed our cities to recognize that our people needed resources. Uh, we were an organization that was able to put out almost a million dollars in, in CARES Act funding and also fundraised hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to give out to the community so that they can have access to food. Um, and then on top of that, like we, we organize our people to get their ballots in. So a lot of people come in and they do, you know, helpful things and they phone bank and things like that. No, there were actually people on the ground during COVID teaching grandmas and teaching everybody how to turn in their ballots, going door to door and still doing that uh, contact because we knew what it meant if 45 was not going to get out and we knew what that meant and how detrimental it was going to be to our community. And so these are some of the ways that we organized during that time. We are one of the only five cities that got police out of schools. And that is, I mean, it was a fight between Southeast Asian uh, uh, and black organizers. We, we uh, came together and we worked on a issue that really impacted all of our communities and, and made that happen during the midst of the pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, those were some of the things that we were able to do. Great, thank you, Kajra. And it's, it's really inspiring to hear about your, your recent victories too in Madison. And, um, you know, there's these really visible moments of movement building and uprisings, but I think Freedom Inc's work shows how much, um, you know, years of work really kind of went into these like, um, you know, immediate moments that, that we've been seeing over this past summer. Um, and for our last question to wrap up, I wanted to ask um, Mumita about your uh, work with Queen's Mutual Aid Network. And um, if you could talk about um, the, the um, efforts that you've built in Queen's um, of a mutual aid as a, as a form of community care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 
the borough of Queens is uh, known for being a transportation desert. There's like parts of Queens that you just cannot connect to. Um, there aren't really any buses. And so during that time, there were parts of Queens, especially where I live, um, and it, food, um, food pantries to um, even groceries that were open were inaccessible to people. And we had um, these programs that the city and the mayor was about and saying that um, we're providing 500,000 halal meals because it was also during Ramadan and majority of Bangladeshis are Muslim. And so they were um, observing and the restaurants that had normally made the food, right? For people who were fasting, were going out of business because there were local mom and pop stack shops that couldn't afford rent. So we had this situation where um, the mayor um, had put out programs where he was say uh, where meals would be delivered, but you had to have an email address in order to get those meals, um, which most of these immigrant community members and elderly people did not have access to. And the because we were a transportation desert, we also had very um, low service broadband internet, mostly low income families that don't have good access to Wi Fi and things like that. So, so technology and access to that portal that meal delivery was um, um, was to, uh, for many people who were at the front lines of the pandemic. And so for us community care was understanding the needs of the community, being ethnically appropriate with the food that we were gathering for these communities and connecting restaurants and mom and pop shops, right? Um, with, uh, raising money and getting them to make the food that was ethnically appropriate for the, that community and for our seniors. Um, my, at one point we found out during, the pandem during this whole process is that the 500,000 meals that the mayor had bragged about, the halal meals, were, were, um, were supplied by military contractors, the same ones who started a war, right, that served in uh, food to um, Iraqi refugees and provided food uh, to during the, the war. The same con contractors that financed the destabilization of the Middle East. So it was an insult to the community. And on top of that, the food itself was so ableist. Um, it wasn't really anything, it was undignified. And so we are living in a city uh, that is the richest city uh, on earth in a state whose economy eclipses those of nations in the richest country in the world. And we couldn't provide a dignified meal to our community. So for us, community care was actually understanding the people who are impacted. So what we did is we knew that in our area, especially there, was, there wasn't there was really a mutual aid network that was that vibrant. Most of the mutual aid networks, localized ones were in Astoria and in um, Forest Hills and like Jackson Heights, places that were very much gentrified. But the two places that were really impacted were like Jamaica, Southeast Queens, um, Corona. And so, so what we did was we brought 300 volunteers together and we started making sure that we won. We were language accessible. So we um, translated all of our documents so everybody could have access to it. We started doing training, um, trainings to um, organize folks and to do mutual aid work. We started getting community organizations involved to provide food um, or resources that we can then deliver to people. And um, the number one thing that we did was be ethnically uh, uh, gather food that was healthy and ethnically appropriate, that things that people can feel and feel good about eating. Um, and and so that was very important to us. And also um, being on the phone with folks and helping them with unemployment, filling out unemployment um, documents um, and and also uh, be seniors who didn't have an email address, like literally creating these things for them and getting those needs 
meals, uh, getting them to be signed up to these meal efforts. Um, we also did a lot of advocacy with the governor, uh, the uh, in the to the mayor. Um, we even sat down with the food czar, Catherine Garcia. Uh, we questioned her about it. We were like, why are we getting military rations? Why are our seniors getting granola bars, which they can't even bite into because, you know, um, it's, it's totally ableist. And, um, and these were, so for us, what we did was build mutual aid around what the community wants by actually recognizing who our neighbors are and really listening to their needs and creating a very grassroots community funded women led um, effort that that was designed around their needs. So if like there was if it, so a region where it was a food desert, we got folks with cars in like Forest Hills, Astoria to go and deliver to them. Um, we helped tenants who were on rent strike and didn't have enough money to afford food. And we supported them. And we reached out to um, elected officials and people on behalf of communities who didn't have, couldn't speak English. So we were sort of like an alternative 311 that doesn't keep you on hold for like a million hours. And, um, you know, that uh, at the end of the day, the reason why we were able to do this is because we were all women mm -hmm. from the communities that we were serving. Um, and we, I think that hopefully there is a second phase coming. So hopefully people listened because uh, there were lots and lots of mutual aid efforts and we did have an, we did have an impact because, uh, the the way the city handled the the whole thing the pandemic was just deplorable right. and um and we showed what community care looks like it looks like literally thinking about the folks um who are impacted not hiring contractors and people who don't live here in queens uh people who don't look like us people who don't struggle like us right providing food or running programs and wasting literally millions on consultants that's what the city did and what we did we only we we raised 50,000 less than $50,000 and we were still able to serve over 2,000 families um, and and especially during Ramadan on a weekly basis help 500 families thank you Mamita and I think it's really shows how you know the people who are really most able to provide the kinds of care and resources that are needed are the impacted communities themselves and um, how they really have the kinds of resources to provide that for each other. Um, so thank you so much, Wanyi, um, Kajua, and Mumita. Um, I know we could have you know this conversation for a lot longer, um, but um, we'd like to move into um, some of the kind of closing um, parts of the, our program for today. And um, I'd also like to, uh, before we transition into uh, the film, um, shout out um, to Mia Rai, Crystal Beck, and, um, and Cindy Gao, who conducted the interviews with Momita Kajua and Mani. Um, so just to um, transition to the next part of our program, um, we're going to um, show a short film by Garvo Sibilboro, uh, 100 Miles Apart. Garvo is a Filipino American filmmaker in Los Angeles where he directs and edits TV and web commercials. And uh, we're going to show the short film now. So thank you so much. Hello, I'm Tamiya Arai, a member of the APA Voices Core Committee. Thank you. Garbo for donating that beautiful short film to the APA Voices Archive. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Tayo Na, a writer, educator, and accomplished musician and songwriter based in Queens, New York, who will be closing out today's program. Tayo's work and music reflect a deep commitment to honoring the generations of APA Voices before him through songs like Lovely to Me, Immigrant Mother, and We Belong, Tayo and Magnetic North's powerful tribute to 70s singer-songwriter Chrissy Jima. 
Tayo has used art and music to give life to the stories of immigrants and activists, past and present, who have shaped our shared histories. We can't think of a better way to end today's program as we imagine what building this community archive can mean for future generations to come. So with much love, Tayo Na. Thank you to me and thank you for the whole, to the whole team and APA for organizing this really critically important, beautiful event. Um, it's ultimately inspiring. Um, thank you and that introduction. It's been a good day. Uh, I apologize in advance if my Wi-Fi cuts out. Um, it's, it's a Queens thing. Um, it's a piece called Weeks in the Womb. It's written for our son, who is in my partner Sarah's belly for most of 2020 during the COVID pandemic. It's April, 20 weeks in your mother's womb when she and her sister take a walk through the neighborhood park. A man calls them fucking chinks and spits towards them. Such occasions mark your beginning. The man's hatred and delusion doesn't notice the baby inside her that there is life on top of life in her body. So if he had a knife or acid to throw like some other lost souls in the city, he would have ripped you open or burned through twice the sanctity of my family. This marks your start. 10 weeks prior in the womb, we share momos and tarot buns with Malaya who is visiting from San Jose. We talk to Terte human rights abuses, the plight of the people, Rhapsody, D-Smoke, we satiate the meal, talk about the 20 years between us. When he leaves, we hug, I clean the plates, notice purple crumbs that smile. 10 weeks prior in the womb, your mother and I weep over the film, Queen and Slim. We stand in the lobby of the theater, arms wrapped and sobbing, bracing the heartbreak of a fictional reality we know to be true. This is your first movie. Eight weeks prior in the womb, Annie and Moss have their baby shower for your baby buddy Dash. This is your first party. Nine weeks prior in the womb, my old bandmate Takenori plays his West Montgomery fingers over his hollow body guitar at Tomy's. I heard, I know you heard that reverb by the way you dance in the womb. This is your first concert. Our friend Abe plays drums, delivers lines and belts at the signature theater like we've never seen them before, like audiences have never seen before. Cambodian rock band, this is your first play. At a day of remembrance at the J Church, you and your mother love the Inari Zushi. You come from a long line of people who love Inari across seas through barbed wire fences. The Lakers went on a run in March, only to be stopped by Brooklyn. We are on the couch. Your father watches the games on the TV while your mother naps. We rest while caressing you over your mother's belly. These warm hands, your first blanket. 20 weeks in the womb, we are alive during a genocide through federal neglect over 10,000 dead and no sign of the number slowing down from Queens to Brooklyn, Detroit to Chicago, New Orleans to Newark. There aren't enough beds, ventilators, masks, gloves, scrubs, care, compassion, generosity to adequately deal with this pandemic in the richest country in the world. 20 weeks in the womb and those nurses, doctors, grocery store clerks, farmers, delivery folks on the front lines continue to go to work. Their courage moves us. Your uncle, the baker, lost his job like millions of other people in this country. He, like all of them, did not deserve this. He's still baking though, making tutorials online. He makes a dough as tender and beautiful as his heart. His bread is waiting for you. Your mother persists too, holds space for her team. Your father holds space for his students as best we can in these virtual spaces. 20 weeks in the womb, the earth is reshaping itself. We are breathing in an age where there is a shortage of breaths. You take your breaths amidst water through a cord to your mother underneath the cocoon of a belly, soft like milk bread. 21 weeks in, your mother starts experiencing Braxton Hicks contractions, brief cramps that are said to prepare her body for your birth. 
nature, true to her programming, invites us into signals of what is to come before it is fully present. The deaths keep ballooning. Public school staff, MTA staff, folks in prison. Arundhati Roy once spoke about the era of new genocide as a byproduct of globalization. New genocide occurs when human imposed conditions lead to mass death without actually going out and killing other people. An example would be economic sanctions against Iraq, when in 1997 and 1998, US sanctions on Iraq claimed more than half a The overwhelming majority of losses being preventable if contingency, contingency plans, available equipment, and medical staff were deployed to people in timely and responsive ways. You are in the womb during a new genocide. Its capital is the city of your father's birth. Your parents, friends, and colleagues are losing their fathers, brothers, friends, grandparents. These are swift pummeling deaths. Cleave lungs and vocal cords like Eric Gardner say their names. They can't breathe. Breathe. We breathe through masks, marking each of your beginnings, making sure we remember the first word starting again. Life. Warm blankets. Bread. Each other. By the end of May, we know the names of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and more. Something cracks open, the streets flood with protesters, statues fall, statements and more statements fly. Former students lead the way while we quarantine with your mother. A tipping point, a rebellion, a reckoning in response to double pandemics. Black American spring, this birthed here right before you. 30 weeks in the womb, you, your mother and I decide a name for you, Jayu. In Korean, it means freedom, free, both noun and adjective. You are Jayu, can be Jayu, feel Jayu. May you know what this year means, this moment, and may it be in our mother's tongues. At 36 weeks, we welcome a Monstera Deliciosa to add to our plant family. The Swiss cheese plant grows holes in her adult leaves so light cascades to the smaller leaves below. What holes will we grow to let love shine through to our young? What do we let go to give space for? Week 41, contractions accelerate, muscles tighten and release in the rhythm of a storm, divinely dangerous, the labor which begets all labor, the work that precedes all work, rings of fire. Week 41, you're here, Jayu is late, is on time. Wednesday, August 26th, the Milwaukee Bucks and NBA team goes on strike, the first time for any professional sports team to do so. The Sunday before, Wisconsin police hail seven bullets and paralyze a 29-year-old Black father, Jacob Blake, in front of his children. At a protest in Kenosha, two protesters are shot to death. Other major sports athletes also act in solidarity with the Bucks. It's four years to the day when Kaepernick first kneels in a game. Freedom contracts, freedom cascades. When you first slide out of your mother's womb, you take a moment and realize you're no longer in a world of amniotic fluid. You cry. Skin to skin with us soothes you. Your mother can't believe how small you are. A miniature nose, feet, hands, to think we were all that tiny once, small bundles turning into tall things. Jai. Thank you, y'all. Wow, my words will not do justice for all that I'm feeling right now. Um, thank you, Tayo, for such a heartfelt reading. Um, for bringing light and life into these difficult moments of what feels like perpetual chaos and crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight in community. Um, I hope that you share with me this feeling of fullness 
nourishment and abundance that will ca carry you through whatever is left of this year. Um, if you want to rewind or revisit any parts of a conversation from tonight, we have recorded the entire event and we'll be making it available on the APA homepage and YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, I wanna give a big and hearty shout out um, to the entire APA Voices core team for turning this project vision into a reality. Um, Nina, Vivian, Tamia, and the super staff at the APA Institute, Amita, Laura, um, thank you for keeping us grounded and committed to our vision for this project. Thank you to all of our wonderful project collaborators um, and partners near and far, and to Shannon at the Tendermint for helping us build a digital archive uh, that centers critical care and radical kinship. Of course, none of this would be possible um, without our project volunteers, narrators, artifact donors, contributors, who uh, you are now seeing popping up on your screen. So thank you all so much for your participation and for putting your energy into growing this project into what it is today. Um, it's just been so inspiring to see how vast this project has grown and to see the number of people um, involved in the project or right? bringing so much intention into how we're thinking about community archiving and the possibilities of um, what it's like to reimagine archiving as an activist practice. Right. So to learn more about the APA Voices Project, to be interviewed by one of us, um, to join as an interviewer or to donate a digital artifact, please visit our new website, which is included in the uh, chat box. In the next several months, we will be expanding this project in important and critical ways, as Crystal mentioned earlier, emphasizing narrators and uh, project contributors, donors who are Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian. Uh, communities that have been so severely and disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, and lastly, this event is part of a series, so please mark on your calendars for the next phase, the next event, which, which will be next year on February 22nd. Um, again, want to give a big shout out to all of the folks who contributed are part of this project. Thank you so much. Um, if we want to just do a group, I don't know, movement, um, until then, thank you so much all for sharing space with us tonight, and we hope to see you next time.